Hi, I'm David, and this is John, and we're the Debt Free Guys. And uh, it's time for another Money Master interview. Uh, this is for the month of January. And uh, with us today is Melanie Lockhart of the Dear Debt blog. So, Melanie. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Why don't you go Welcome. ahead and introduce yourself to us, uh, to our readers, for individuals who haven't read the, the text version of uh, the Money Master post. Uh, why don't you give us yeah. an introduction to who you are? Of course. My name is Melanie Lockhart. I write at DearDebt.com. I am a freelance writer who has gotten out of $81,000 in student loan debt. Yay. I've made my last payment a month ago, which was so exciting. Nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. And it's been really, really wonderful to just have like one whole month of being debt free. And it just feels so weird to not make a payment. But, um, you know, I am a freelance writer. I'm an event planner. I'm a blogger. I really want to inspire people to get out of debt. And I really focus on sort of that emotional aspect of getting out of debt. You know, there's so many wonderful people out there with great financial tips. And of course, I want to provide those as well. But I really sort of focus on that emotional relationship with debt, with money. You know, so many of us don't really address that part of it. And I think a lot of us get into debt because maybe, you know, we feel like we're not worth it or, you know, we're not really addressing other parts of our mental landscape. So yeah, totally. That's That's, what I do. I love you. You address the emotional aspect of it because money is very emotional. We tie so much very of our self worth and our value and our you know our progress in life to how much money we have or are earning. Um, and I think that's a lot of the reason why people. Um, a good percentage of people get into debt because, um, mm-hmm. you know, they, they use their credit card to just to validate themselves, to buy things yeah. that make them feel worthwhile. Make um, them feel better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I'm smarter. I have more of an education. <laughs> I have a PhD, but I also have $500,000 of credit card debt. Right. <laughs> or student yeah. loans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but it, is, sure. it is interesting how many relationships are made and then broken on the backs of money. You know, the financial decisions mm-hmm. that end up causing so many people to divorce mm-hmm. or break up mm-hmm. or, you know, it's, it's sad that it, that causes and the emotional impact that that has on everybody down the line, children, yep. family and friends. And, and unfortunately that a lot of gets tied back to this relationship with money. So if we could fix that relationship, mm-hmm. a lot of other yes. relationships would get exactly. fixed as well. Yeah, totally. So uh, exactly. this is your first month without having to make a credit card or having to make a, a, a loan a payment. Student loan payment. Yeah. Nice. So you're yeah, like, you're like a couple hundred dollars richer. Yeah, no, like a thousand dollars richer. Like I was putting two to four thousand dollars per month towards my student loans oh, nice. for the awesome. past couple of months. So, you know, that's a huge amount of money that <laughs> right. now I'm yeah. not putting towards my student loans. So it's a really, really great feeling. Yeah, that's cool. I, that was one of the big things that we recognized after we paid off our credit card debt was, wow, we don't have to send all that money now so we can do something with I it. Know. <laughs> and right. you want to buy something even. fancy, yeah. but you know, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Got to try to keep it frugal still a little bit. Yeah, right. totally. You totally. feel like you just get this instant pay raise. You know, yeah. All of a sudden mm-hmm. your money is now yours. I mean, it always has been yours, but you feel like yeah. that really is yours to use the way you want to rather than sending it off to yeah. some bank or institution. Yeah. So you are. Yeah. It's amazing how rich I feel now that I'm not putting, you know, several thousand dollars a month towards my student loans. I'm like, right. that is in my savings account. That's going to be invested soon. Right. You know, yeah. I can well, actually afford these things now. <laughs> right. And that's indicative of, of, of how we live our lives today. So, you know, you're, you got $81,000 with our student loans, but people on top of their student loans, they are financing their car, they're financing their house. In some ways, they're financing, you know, the things in their house, credit cards. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're constantly owing somebody money, how are you ever really actually getting ahead? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Writing sort of those checks. Treadmill hamster wheel of just constantly borrowing and owning, right. borrowing and owning. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's a lot more fun. Like David's right now saving up for um, an Audi, which I think we're on target right. to get in um, August. Yeah, August. August. Yeah. So it's been really, it's a lot more fun to put that invest, that money in an, an account and watch it grow, mm-hmm. knowing what the goal is going to be rather than getting the car and then having to write the student, this student, uh, this car loan every payment every month. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Over- so I'm curious about the eighty-one thousand um, dollars. That was all student loan debt, and what? How did you? What was that combination of tuition and lifestyle, or what? Yeah. Was that? 
so it was all student loans and it was primarily from NYU, <laughs> fancy <laughs> private school for my master's degree. So I borrowed $23,000 for my undergrad, which wasn't too bad. Um, I went good. to Cal State Long Beach, um, just sort of paid the minimum for a while, didn't really think much of it. And then I got into NYU, I applied to go there. I thought it was going to be the best thing ever. And, you know, in a similar sort of emotional way, I thought NYU would legitimize me as a creative person, you know, as an artist, as an educator that, yeah. you know, going to such a prestigious school would, you know, mean that I'm successful, right? And so right. the tuition was $52,000 a year. And luckily, it was a one year program. Um, nice. But I took out 58,000 sort of for living expenses as well. And I also worked three jobs while living in New York. So I was actually able to lower my student loans. I could have probably borrowed an additional 100,000 at NYU, but I kept the 58. But yeah, 58 plus 23, $81,000 total that I've borrowed yeah. <laughs> for both of my degrees. And, you know, it's an insane amount of money. And I've paid a lot more than that, probably with all the interest. Right. Right. Um, you know, those grad plus loans are like 7.9% interest, which is yeah, insane. Crazy. Right. And then, you know, my other loans were at 6.8. So when you have $58,000 at 6.8 <laughs> and 7.9, it was a lot right. of interest every day. I, I, you know, calculated it at one point, it was $11 going to interest per day. And wow. you know, that was a huge wake up call for me. And I was and like, I have to get out of this. This is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So in hindsight, what would you have done differently? Would you have not gone to NYU? Would you have saved prior yeah. to applying or? This you, is a maybe, really, maybe of, <laughs> this is a tricky was just answer. Thinking about, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's a tricky answer because I feel like the answer has changed over the years. Like, has you it? know, a few <laughs> years ago, I was really extremely bitter and mad and angry and I beat myself up for going to an expensive private school and I was broke and in debt and I just thought, what did I do? Why did I ever do this? This is horrible and so stupid, you know? And I would have <laughs> said, oh, I would definitely never have gone, right? And, you know, now it's like, in some weird, bizarre universe, this pain point of mine has now turned into my blog, which has turned into my career, which has opened yeah. up this whole new life that I never expected. And also, right. to be honest, living in New York was always kind of on my bucket list. And so that's, you know, one of those things I can cross off the list and say, I've done it. I've lived in New York. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think you know, over time, it's like, what I would have done differently, I probably would have had more in savings or at least like been able to pay for all of it or a good portion of my tuition first. Yeah. Um, I think I would have definitely done that. Um, but, you know, while I was there, I did the best I could. I worked three part time jobs while going to school to make sure that I wasn't borrowing an additional hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, I didn't have an excessive lifestyle in school at all. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, what I would have done differently is definitely saved more, had more money up front. And then for people that are considering going to an expensive private school, I would really suggest, you know, looking at other options and realizing that dream schools can just be a dream. You know, it's yeah. like once you reach that fantasy, like reality is never as good as your fantasy, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. I had this dream of like, oh, it's gonna be the best thing ever. And it's like, it's a school. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Wait, in, it's a school. <laughs> it was a little interesting in reading your interview on our website, how you talked about going to that school and the, the expectations you had. But then after getting out of school, you still found it to be a struggle to find a job, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, it, in New York, I struggled for, you know, six months. I had like 30 interviews. It was so ridiculous. And you know, I had part-time work to get by. I was teaching theater in Harlem. I was doing all these random gigs. I was working, but I needed a full-time job to pay rent and my student loans. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, at some point I just realized, like, I really can't afford to do both. And it is important for me to pay back my student loans. So I moved to Portland, Oregon, where I am now, to be with my partner and to get a lower cost of living. So, yeah, nice. yeah. so it all worked yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> <In me. laughs> Right. Um, so, go ahead. I was going to say, you, you mentioned that uh, you were working part-time jobs during that time period. Is that kind of how mm -hmm. you got hooked into the whole side hustle 
you know, that became your way of life? You know, I, I worked three part-time jobs in school and that just sort of like was a lifestyle thing that I knew I didn't really want to take on a ton, a ton of debt. And then really when I got addicted to side hustling was after graduation. And, you know, I was still teaching part-time in Harlem, you know, I was still doing gigs here and there, but I was not making an income that, you know, I could live off of. I was really barely just able to afford my rent. And so I remember going on Craigslist and I was like, I need to make a hundred bucks this week. Like, <laughs> what can I do legally <laughs> this week to make a hundred bucks? And I found this gig on Craigslist to be a brand ambassador and pretty much it was this gig. They were like, we're hosting a pet adoption event in Central Park. All you do is hand out flyers and try to get people to come. We'll pay you 20 bucks an hour and you're going to get paid this week. And I was like, I can totally do that. Right. <laughs> and I did it. It was great. And that, that sort of got me into the brand ambassador world, which is a really fascinating world. You know, if you ever go to concerts or sporting events or other kind of events and you see people in the t-shirts giving away free stuff, that's a brand ambassador. And you know, they pay pretty well, you know, between 15 and $25 an hour, you know, for at least a side gig, it pays pretty well. And it's really flexible hours. You do it when you want, you usually get free stuff. And so that was kind of my main side hustle in New York. And like, like, wow, I can actually make money pretty easily. <laughs> like if I just really look for it and these random sort of, you know, the gig economy. Yeah, right. Right. Oh, yeah. That's good. So what is one of the best side hustle stories and the worst side hustle story? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the best side hustles I ever did, um, I worked this really fun art show in Brooklyn where I pretty much just stood there and made sure like people didn't break the artwork. It was like, <laughs> this really cool industrial space, you know, had like a fun DJ, free alcohol, like lots of fun booze. Oh, cool. um, so pretty much I got paid twenty dollars an hour just to stand there and like people watch and have a fun art experience. That was really fun. <laughs> that sounds um, cool. Yeah, that's just a typical Friday night for us. <laughs> yeah, and I, I definitely know my worst side hustle. It's so embarrassing to even admit this, but it's totally on my blog, so I guess it's not news. But um like two and a half years ago, when I was blogging and I was working full time and I was still trying to make extra money. I had taken on this task rabbit gig to clean this guy's um, like dishes in his fridge. It was like a simple gig. It was like, come clean my dishes, clear out my fridge. That's it. 20 bucks an hour. I was like, I could totally do that. And so I, you know, loaded things in his dishwasher. I put the soap in, press go. Everything's good to go. And his dishwasher starts flooding. And I was like, oh, no. what? what is going on here? And then he was like, you didn't use this soap, did you? And I was like, um, yeah, that's the only soap that I see. And he was like, it says do not use in the dishwasher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have, I've never used a dishwasher in my whole entire life. Oh, no. I've always <laughs> washed dishes. I've never even had a dishwasher. Yeah. So I just thought all the soap was the same. <laughs> so it was flooding all over the oh, no. I ran it like three or four or five times. And it was still just flooding. And I was like, I think I legit broke his dishwasher. Oh, no. And I was like, this $20 an hour side hustle is completely worthless and pointless. <laughs> and I'm so horrified. <laughs> and because it went through a third party, TaskRabbit, I was like, look, you do not have to pay me for this. I will talk to TaskRabbit. I will get this fixed. Like, just please don't give me a bad review because it's a review system. And I was like, right, he's going to give right. me a horrible review and I'm never going to work again. <laughs> and right. I was like, look, don't pay me. I'm going to figure this out. I don't know how to fix it, but I will <laughs> fix it somehow. Right. And then like somehow it did get fixed. Like TaskRabbit, help, TaskRabbit helped out the situation I thought was fixed. And then three months later, he like left me a terrible review. Oh, oh no. Like she was awful. It was horrible. She ruined my whole kitchen and everything. I was like, <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Wow. So he was harboring really that for a while. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm really grateful I'm a writer now because the whole like domestic goddess thing obviously was not working. Out. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, just want to give a shout out to like my most horrible. <laughs> <laughs> just want to give a shout out. We have uh, someone join the group here. John Graham joined. So thanks for joining, John. Oh, we're uh, we're in interviewing uh, 
uh, Melanie Lockhart of Dear Debt Blog uh, as a money master on the Debt Free Guys website. So um, she was just telling us this, one of the best and worst stories of, <laughs> of her so side nice hustle story. career. So, so yeah, uh, that's a pretty question. hilarious story. <laughs> our next question is, um, how did you, what was your main strategy for paying off debt? Did you focus on increasing your income or did you focus on um, being frugal or lowering your expenses or a combination? Definitely a combination. You know, I think that it's so important to do both. You know, I think a lot of people sort of focus on limiting their expenses first, which is definitely like an easy, quick win strategy. You know, I'm not going to go to the gym anymore. I'm giving up my membership. I'm you know, not going to drive, like all these sort of things. Um, but for me, what I realized, like when I first moved to Portland, it's like I didn't have a car. I didn't have a gym membership. I sharing a studio apartment with my partner, like, really small place like I didn't have a lot of things like there wasn't anywhere that I could cut back further you know and sort of like when you're going through your personal finance journey and you're like I've cut out this 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 like aside from moving back home with my parents I'm like not eating like I can't so I can't cut back anymore right and so I was like I, I hit a plateau with my debt payments and I was like I'm not putting enough towards debt each month even cutting back. And so that's when I really focused on earning more with the side hustles and increasing my income because I realized that was really the gateway towards paying off debt quickly because even as much as you cut back, life still costs money. It's still expensive. Right. <laughs> and that's you know, true. if you can it's focus America. on earning more, I personally found that earning more was more fun and more rewarding, you know, minus that story that I just told, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in general, it can be more empowering, more fun. Uh, you know, it can be exhausting as well to juggle when you're working full time, especially, but, you know, if you keep the goal in mind and say, you know, I really want to be debt free sooner rather than later. And every time I work an extra gig, you know, early morning nights, weekends that, you know, this is going towards my debt repayment. Right, right. And you've really embraced the gig economy. I mean, that's, that's your yeah. sole, sole uh, income right now, right? You've got several different side yeah. hustles you're managing. Yeah, definitely. You know, now I primarily work as a freelance writer and sort of event planner. But, you know, for a long time, I brand ambassador work was a large part of my income, you know, yeah. up until like early last year. You know, for the past couple of years, I was making five to $10,000 per year being a brand ambassador. I worked nice. as a pet sitter. I did holiday events, you know, for churches and for uh, just random people, you know, on Craigslist and TaskRabbit. The holidays are a great time to make money, by the way. You know, yeah. tons of people are having holiday parties, um, different events, and they're always, they, they always need like a coat check person or someone to pour wine right. or, you know, do right. all that kind of stuff. So... And some I've for really you, embraced... some for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've really yeah. embraced the gig economy because there are so many ways to make money these days. And especially if you're working to get out of debt, why not take advantage of all of those things? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's interesting. John asked a, a question here. He asked, were you paying yourself during that period? Maybe um, you could just talk a little bit about when you're working in the gig economy and you are having, you have all these little side hustles. How do you mm -hmm. pay yourself versus mm -hmm. getting a paycheck? You know, what's the, how does that work yeah. for someone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now that I'm a full-time freelancer, um, you know, I sort of try to set myself a salary, you know, so I get paid a lot, not, well, sort of a lot now, but you know, I get paid a certain amount, right? And then I shave taxes off the top, which is super important if you're working in the gig uh, economy as a that. freelancer, you know, right. that's something I wasn't quite clear on when I first started out. I was like, oh, sweet, I'm just making all this money. And I was like, oh, I, taxes aren't getting taken out. Uncle oh, Sam. Gotta, <laughs> gotta take that out myself. So, you know, I automatically just deduct like 20, 25% off the top, put it in a separate tax fund. And then, you know, after I get paid a certain amount, I sort of transfer it over to my personal checking and pay myself a salary. And so mm -hmm. I think that amount, you know, depends on who you are. You know, when I was paying off debt, I spent everything I made. And I meant that, I mean that to say that all of it went to debt or savings mm -hmm. or my bills. And, yeah. you know, I am a sole proprietor, so I am the business. Um, yeah. So, you know, in that way, I just sort of, 
put everything back into myself and my debt and everything. And, you know, now that I am debt free, I'm sort of focusing on paying myself like an actual livable salary while also keeping more in business savings, mm -hmm. um, starting to invest and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Very cool. Nice. And um, as a freelancer, you pay taxes quarterly, right? Is that yes. true? <laughs> yeah, so. Paid a lot last year. <laughs> Don't judge that. Yeah. 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 Right. So no. I think it's definitely something that's important for people who want to go from being a W two or to a W nine or that you know your taxes mm -hmm. are your responsibility and you're not only paying yep. them or dealing with them once a year, but you have to deal with it quarterly. Right. Um, so yep. definitely, like you said, shave whatever you need to off the top to make sure you don't um, get yeah, in trouble just with it. Put it in a separate account. Don't even look yeah. at it. <laughs> yeah, it was never yours to begin with, so don't even look at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so our next question is, why do you think people struggle with making more money? What do you think their, um, their, their limiting belief is or their what holds them back? limitations are? Yeah, I think, you know, what holds people back is sort of feeling like they don't know where to start or how to go about it, or they feel like, oh, that's for other people, not for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember just a few years ago, I used to see people making money on the side or making lots of money from, you know, freelance income. And I thought, I can never do that. How do they do that? Oh, that, that's for other people, not for me. And then I really had to look at some of my limiting beliefs and say, I just kind of have to get over myself and just do it right. <laughs> and, you know, figure it out and fail and work hard and try. And, you know, I think everybody has the ability to make more money. You know, of course, I want to point out there are certain privileges we are all afforded that, you know, are, you know, to be considered as well. But, you know, in general, I think most people can work hard to make more money and sort of have to get over those limiting beliefs and just focus on the end goal and look at all the resources around you as well. And, and don't be intimidated by them. Yeah, right. That's true. So what would you recommend for somebody who's thinking about joining the, joining the W9 club um, who doesn't want to have to recreate the wheel? What resources yeah. would you recommend they use to maybe sort of help figure what their path is? Yeah, for sure. So uh, my mentor and one of my favorite bloggers is Carrie Smith from carefulsense.com. Yes. Yeah. She has, you know, such a great blog about how to be a solopreneur, how to, you know, quit your full-time job to be, you know, a freelancer. And I definitely would not have quit my job without her guidance. Oh, she is amazing. Yes. Um, so she has a great resource, um, you know, and also just sort of reading other blogs. You know, I also like Carolyn Kelso from Made Vibrant. She's a creative entrepreneur as well. Mariah Cause from Fempreneur. How do you say Fempreneur? It's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. But um, she's awesome as well. And then, you know, really networking with others and also looking at resources. You know, there's... There are ways to start small, you know, being a brand ambassador, which you can find on Craigslist or Facebook, um, going on TaskRabbit, which you can do tons of different gigs for other people, Postmates, you can deliver people food, um, Uber, Lyft. There are ways to start small in the gig economy within these systems that are already there. You can make money tomorrow, literally. And then you can sort of work that way up into figuring out what you want to do, like whether that's more specialized, like freelance writing, editing, social media, blogging, whatever. And, you know, you can start small and sort of work your way up until you find sort of your groove and you understand how things work. Nice. Sure. Very good. Great advice. Do you, um, one of the things that resources that we've been very um, compelled by um, since we met you at FinCon was, um, is the FinCon group on uh, Facebook. Yes. And so we've been advising our readers and followers to find their people find groups that they would like to participate mm -hmm. in within Facebook because those people are inspiring and help answer questions mm -hmm. you might have. So it's uh, definitely a pretty cool resource to use. Yeah, we have a. I love yeah. the FinCon yeah. Facebook yes. group. I've, I've legit gotten gigs from that FinCon Facebook group. Nice. Actually, one of my best clients I got from that uh, Facebook group. So yeah, networking yeah. on social media, Twitter, and Facebook can go a long way. Yeah, nice. it's not just about gossip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Hey, uh, John, just wanted to thank you for your hashtag there, the Dub Niner. That's pretty cool. Um, I like it. Okay. The format we have uh, here is typically uh, an interview style format, but uh, you uh, either have a question or a comment. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, let you express that or ask that. 
Right on, right on. So I'm, I'm loving the conversation, guys. This is really cool. Um, Thank you. Awesome. And, and I really appreciate your story, Melanie, of uh, you know digging out of a debt hole, right? So um, as a, uh, a side hustler myself, uh, nice. so social media and digital media uh, marketing consultant, uh, who is you know gone from creative to um, you know entrepreneur back into uh, employee life, but uh, yeah. you know using the skills acquired as an entrepreneur to you know increase earning potential in a in a yeah. corporate environment. Right? So uh, my wife and I have recently, like in the last three months, paid down about twenty two or twenty three thousand dollars. Wow, that's nice. huge. Uh, I sold a car, got a 10 year old car, got rid of a car note, like all of these things. And, uh, and really the question that I wanted to ask or really the comment was, um, when I, when I asked about paying yourself, what I meant was, you know, one of the, one of the key principles that we've learned in a lot of the books that we've been reading is taking a percentage of anything you earn, setting it aside for savings to build mm -hmm. up an investment mm -hmm. fund, and yep. then you can sort of accelerate, uh, sort of your wealth accumulation. So I wanted to know more so. Were you doing that even in the darkest of days and mm -hmm. times as an entrepreneur? Yes. You know, back in the darkest days when I was making 10 to $12 an hour and on food stamps, I still made a point to save even at least 1% of my income. And that's something that I really encourage people to do. You know, I feel like, you know, we often throw around like, oh, you have to save 10% of your income. And to be honest, for some people, that's just not attainable when right. you're really... Okay really broke and I really want to encourage people even if it's one percent you know if you're making two thousand dollars a month you know save twenty dollars a month like whatever you can save right. put something aside for yourself so that you can have that money at a later date you know I think paying yourself first is so important I've always believed in automating your savings and that's okay. been sort of a strategy to help me build wealth and build savings so that you know, I always have something to the side, I have an emergency fund. I'm, I'm yeah. also a huge fan of sub savings accounts. So, you know, I have Capital One 360, which allows you to have like, I think, 25 different savings accounts. So I had a savings account for taxes, for Spain, for my emergency fund, for yeah. contact lenses, for FinCon. <laughs> you know, I had all right. these different sub savings accounts because I realized that you know, if all my money was muddled in my checking account, I didn't really know where it was going or what it was doing. Right. But when I saw yeah. it in these separate savings account, which were clearly labeled, you know, FinCon, travel, taxes, I knew what they were going for. So mm -hmm. yes, I think paying yourself first is vitally important. Um, whatever you can, you know, 1%, 10%, yeah. 15%, if you can do more, do more, it's still yours, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Well, I think even if you're currently in your darkest days right now, if you are able to save even a, f a fraction of your income, it does something emotionally and mentally for you that you're not only thinking about limiting your, your, your cutting your lifestyle down, but you're also trying to think about how you can expand your lifestyle. And I think that does something to you, you know, it's kind of inspirational. Right. Yeah. You, you, have, you have a future focus rather than a just a here and now focus. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and drop that. Cool. Thanks no, for joining thank us. You. Thanks thank for you joining for your us. Question. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So our last question to you is what is your favorite aspect of living the side hustle entrepreneur lifestyle today? Yeah. My favorite aspect of side hustling and freelancing and being a solopreneur is really the ability to learn more skills in a non-threatening environment and also to network with people that I probably would never have met otherwise. You know, I have come across a ton of different people through my various side hustles over the years that I probably would have never crossed paths with. And I think, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm the type of person that I feel like I can learn something from everyone. So, you know, coming across people that might not be, you know, someone that I would cross paths with in general is really interesting to me. Um, you know, I've been able to learn about websites and HTML and blogging and social media, like through this other avenue of work that, you know, if I were to, apply for a traditional job, I don't have those skills, but I've been able to sort of learn on the job, you know, through these various different avenues. So right. I think, you know, it's so great to be able to learn new things and network with new people. And so that's my favorite part of side hustling and being a solopreneur. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's very apparent to us, we're both currently w tours, um, and the people in the freelance gig economy space are just so passionate and driven and motivated compared to the, pe the people that sit next to me in my cubicle at work. <laughs> you know, they're just coming in, right? and, you know, punching the clock, so to speak, whereas the, the, the entrepreneurs, the, the giggers, they're just they'll work in 24 seven and they're just making things happen and they're just passionate. Mm -hmm. They can talk to you day and night about whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John, John just pointed out yeah. that's because they control their time. And I think that that's also because not only their time, but they they feel like they're in control of their destiny. Right. You know, when you work mm -hmm. for a corporation, when you're working for someone else, you're contributing to their success, to their destiny much more than you are to your own. But when you're working for mm -hmm. yourself, whether it's lots of small jobs or you're creating your own company, uh, you are building something that you have as your future. You know, it's this whole mm -hmm. now, ver now versus future idea, right. which I think so many people yeah. get stuck in. We, we also had another comment here from uh, Monty Henry one, where he basically said that average American puts less than 5% of their disposable income towards savings. And I think that's mm -hmm. so true. I, I, I saw this uh, statistic the other day, uh, less, what was it? Uh, more than 75% of people in the United States have less than $25,000 saved for retirement. It's yeah. just crazy how much more so here and now people have become focused. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason why we have the Money Master Series is we want to help people be exposed to individuals who are going out there and doing little things and big things to try to change, to move that needle for themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be 65 yeah. and retiring with less money than what they made mm -hmm. the year that, that they retired. So, right. you know, it's great yeah. to that you're able to be that kind of example for people. We really appreciate it. Yeah. And so, I think it's so important because, you know, when you're a side hustler or a solopreneur, you know, at some point when you really do want to change your money or your income, you know, at the end of the day, you sort of do have to put that burden on yourself and say, I am in charge of this. I have to do that. You know, I think a lot of us, myself included, you know, we're waiting for the economy to improve. We're waiting for jobs to get better. We're waiting for to get that raise, to get that promotion. And we're waiting for something else that really never comes or right. it comes and it's not what we expected. And right. so, you know, I think what I had to realize was that if I really wanted to change things, I had to do it myself. Right. And that can be stressful in itself and that can be hard to come to terms with when you're first starting out, but it can also be empowering once you yeah. realize like, wow, I am making extra money on the side. I am improving my income. I am, you know, saving a lot more money now. And so I want to empower people to do it themselves and not wait for some fictional time in history or the economy <laughs> right. you know, yeah. <laughs> to, to start then, right? Right. That's great. <laughs> nice. Well, and that's why we asked you to be our <laughs> January money master. So hey. Thank you. Yeah, hey there, two cup house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice to nice see you to guys. See you. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Melanie, for um, giving us your text interview and for being a part of our blab and um, for all your insight. Um, you're very inspirational to our followers and to David and me. We, um, we thank love your stuff. you. You guys are the best. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And I don't know when we're going to see you again, but hopefully it's soon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely at SpinCon, for yeah. sure. In, and in San Diego. Sooner than later, yeah. So, you know, yeah. yeah. We're actually going to head out to LA, I think, in April. So maybe we'll, or May. Okay. So yeah. maybe we'll have okay, to yeah. merge. We'll track you down. <laughs> yeah, yes, so. for sure. Cool. Well, thank you so much, yeah. uh, Melanie, for joining us and for all of our, our blabbers. Yeah. Um, we'll be back next month with... Um, Amanda Abea from Miami. So yeah. look out for that yeah. uh, text interview coming out the first Friday of February. And then we'll have her blab on the 21st uh, of February. Yeah. So thanks, everyone. Awesome. Awesome. And for those of you who joined halfway through, we will post the whole interview on our website, debtfreeguys.com, if you'd like to go back and watch it. Yep. That'll go up this Monday. So look forward to that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Bye. Bye.